We need to hear all voices. If someone's negative all the time and only complains and never brings anything to the conversation, I, I think there's an opportunity for development there. You know, and if, if they can't change, they would help create the toxic workplace. Hey everyone, it's Amy Lynn Durham and you're listening to Create Magic at Work. Create Magic at Work is on a mission to equip senior leaders with tools they need to be a true quantum leader and actually understand what that means. Improve employee engagement, retain top talent, and transform your workplace culture to have less drama and stress. So let's start making magic. Hey everyone, welcome to another episode of Create Magic at Work. Today I have a special treat for you because my mentor, one of my mentors, has agreed to be a guest on the Create Magic at Work podcast and it's Dr. Judy Neal. A lot of you, I'm sure if you've been listening to past episodes, have heard me reference Edgewalkers and a lot of you have reached out to me saying, I think I'm an Edgewalker. And this sounds exciting to me. So this is really a gift that we get to have uh, Dr. Judy Neal on the show, sharing her wisdom and how she created the Edgewalker program and wrote the book. So a little bit more about Dr. Judy. She's an author, scholar, speaker, and consultant. Her primary focus has been on workplace spirituality, transformation, and global consciousness. No surprise why she's a guest on Create Magic at Work. <laughs> <laughs> After receiving her PhD in organizational behavior from Yale University, she served as an internal consultant to Honeywell for eight years. Judy then taught management at the University of New Haven for 17 years. Her research was on business leaders who have a strong commitment to their spirituality, and she researched the ways in which they bridged the invisible world of spirituality and the material world of business. So create magic at work. It's like... Not even funny. <laughs> Judy was the founding director of the Tyson Center for Faith and Spirituality in the Workplace at the University of Arkansas. She was a co-founder and former chair of the Management, Spirituality, and Religion Interest Group, has served on the MSR Executive Committee. She chairs the MSR Scholarship Committee and was founder of the MSR Flamekeeper Committee. She also serves on the board's of the AITIA Institute and Indica Academy as one of the founding editors of the Journal of Management, Spirituality, and Religion. She is on the journal's editorial board and is also on the board of the journal's parent organization, the International Association of Management, Spirituality, and Religion. What an amazing body of work. Judy is the author of 10 books on workplace spirituality and transformation and as the president, here we go, of Edgewalkers International, <laughs> a workplace spirituality community. Her recent books are Personal, Educational, and Organizational Transformation, published June 2023, and Inspiring Workplace Spirituality, to be published in the fall of 2023. And my favorite, which is so Edgewalkers, is in her spare time, she writes songs and plays the guitar and electric bass in an all-woman band called She's Us. Dr. Judy Neal, welcome to Create Magic at Work. Thank you, Amy. Thank you so much. And, and I recall our first conversation where you said, I think I'm an edge walker. <laughs> and I said, after hearing a little bit about your background, oh, you certainly are without any doubt whatsoever. So it's just a joy to be here. Yeah, thank you so much for for being a guest. And can can we maybe start off just for people that might be new to this? Can you share what what an edge walker is with everyone? No, oh, yeah, my one of my favorite things to do. So a simple definition is an edge walker is somebody who walks between worlds and builds bridges between those worlds. And there's many ways people could do that. They could be um, in a corporate world uh, being a bridge between functions. So, for instance, I had a doctoral student that I write about in the book Edge Walkers, a woman named Sharon Emmons, and she was working in information technology. And her heart was really in the human side of business. And so she was getting her PhD in human resources. And when she finished her work, 
she and this was in a uh, regulated utility, so a very bureaucratic, kind of stodgy organization, and mm-hmm. she wanted to help shake them up. When she graduated, she then became like the translator for people and human resources to understand how IT can information technology can be helpful to human resources. And then in the IT world, she helped them understand what human resources brings to personal and professional development within the company. Mm-hmm. She also had a deeply spiritual side that she didn't feel she could express outwardly in the workplace, but she felt like that was really a source for her, particularly through her creativity which would ring very true for you. And, mm-hmm. uh, yeah, and so, so she's an example of somebody who walked between worlds and integrated them, and that integration increased her contribution uh, to the organization, but also to her life. It brought just so much greater meaning. So yeah. is there more you'd like me to say about that, or is there something you'd like to add? Well... There's so much I want to dive into, but one thing that's coming up for me is I'm curious on the spirituality aspect of being an edge walker. And if you could elaborate on that, because we talk a lot about how edge walkers are people in organizations that can build bridges between two different quote unquote worlds. And you just painted a picture of someone that did that between IT and HR And then if, if I'm someone listening or, you know, even for myself, where does the spirituality aspect come into play for that? Yeah. Wonderful. Thank you. The, um, and for me, that's central. That's Mm -hmm. a central part of walking between worlds is walking between the invisible and the visible worlds of the material world and the spiritual world. There's different languages for it, but it starts with the premise that we're all spiritual beings. Mm -hmm. and that we're all connected to something greater than ourselves. And for some people, that's a religious path, and for others, it might be a more secular or spiritual, generic spiritual path. But but it's a part of the human uh, journey. Mm -hmm. And for some people, it's more central than others. And in organizations, in the work that I research I've done, the organizations that really nurture the human spirit and nurture individual and collective spiritual practices – they are more innovative. They have higher job satisfaction, higher sense of commitment. Um, there's just there's a greater sense of life and purpose in those kinds of organizations. So that they're, they're much more effective. I so I think, um, and I've heard others write about this that spirituality is the critical ingredient to individual and organizational success. Mm. And it has a very broad definition. It's you know it's different for different people. But it's so central. That feels so innovative. Or just to say that spirituality is critical in an organization. Uh, When I first started doing Create Magic at Work and talking about spirituality and spiritual intelligence from a faith neutral perspective, you know, people would often ask me, well, what's the pushback you get when you're talking about this with companies and organizations? And I came from a very from a very hardcore sales quota background. <laughs> let's let's leave it at that. And I, I often heard around meeting tables, you know, we don't have time to do this kumbaya by the fire. We're not into this woo-woo stuff. And I just want to honor what you just said about it being critical because we're recognizing the whole human at work. And towards the the final year of my position before I left, I pretty much was like, are they going to fire me for doing these human connecting activities? And I'm going to prove that we're going to be number one because of this. And the data is there, right? So what's your take on why some, not all, some senior leaders may choose to ignore the data? You know, it's funny because senior leaders talk about being data driven Mm -hmm. and they're not. They use data to substantiate what their core values are. Mm. And if their core values are control and predictability, they're going to pay attention to data that supports control and predictability. 
And if their core values are innovation and creativity and meaning and purpose, then they'll pay attention to the data that supports that. But there, really, it doesn't come down to data. It comes down to what is your, your what are your values, and what's your view of how the world works. Mm-hmm. And, mm-hmm. Uh, I would be willing to bet that at some point in their lives, they have an opportunity to wake up to something greater than they currently experienced. I interviewed a lot of leaders who had really committed to a spiritual path after a period of time, and I asked them. Was there an incident or a time when that became central for you? And for all of them, there was some critical incident that we could call a wake-up call. So it might have been the loss of a job. It might have been a divorce, um, being confronted with a serious illness. There's these crises Mm -hmm. that happen in all of our lives and for some, we can really see that as a wake-up call. Until that happens, I no amount of data or convincing or arguments are going to help. There's a wonderful example of a hospital, and I'm actually forgetting the name of it right now, but Lance Secretan in Canada mm-hmm. was the consultant to this hospital system, and they had built in spirituality at every single level, all these wonderful programs and had a very spiritually centered CEO. The CEO was replaced. And oh, by the way, the organization had grown and was profitable and you know was doing extraordinarily well. And this new CEO came in and said, I'm cutting down all these programs. And then the profitability went down, the best people left, the organization declined dramatically. Because the new CEO even though everything was in place, it had been paid for, all that training and those retreats and everything else, the new CEO didn't value it. And so he just shut down everything and paid the price. And so did Mm -hmm. a lot of other people. Well, that's one of the heartbreaks of the way organizational change can happen. Mm -hmm. But the people who were impacted by the programs never change. They take that with them wherever they go. That's the good news. So true. So true. I could reach back out to some of my old coworkers today. I mean, it makes me emotional and they would like 100% show up for me. I mean, just because of the human connection that we had and it wasn't all about numbers. Uh, so, so thank you for sharing that. One of the skills of an edge walker is having a sense of the future or knowing the future. And I want to talk about that for a little bit, because when I have clients or when we see clients that score really high, there's also some shadow, right, that we should coach on as well. I've talked about that in some prior episodes here at Create Magic at Work, the shadow of scoring really high and things. And I'm wondering, this is just a curious question I have for you, because in knowing the future and in manifesting what maybe you feel you want your future to be, is it possible that shadow could come up and an edge walker could be so focused on manifesting their vision and sensing what they think the future is that they could be closed off to leaving some space for the unimaginable? And for others' visions. Ooh, yes. love that. <laughs> yeah, Love that. So- I'm kind of in the middle of that and having my own shadow come up right now. So what you're asking about is is um, very pertinent to me personally as mm. I go through um, a project that I have a clear vision of, but others don't. And then it's very easy for me to then get into judgment about why can't they see this or why can't I have more of a voice in this? And then my own behavior can block out other people having their voice. And, you know, I can start to try to ramrod something through because I also have a sense of urgency about it. And so definitely there can be a shadow side to the knowing the future because it's like I really feel like I've been called to Uh a particular project and shown all the steps and where the information is and where the relationships are, and I want to move it ahead. 
Um, and I have a funder who's going to support it if I do something now. If I wait too long, I can lose the funder. Mm-hmm. So there's you know all this drive to get things done, and people's feelings are getting hurt. And you know I've got to look at my own judgment about others. So I see the future. I try to make it manifest it. And wherever my own ego is taking over, I cause harm. Mm. So I, you know, it's something for me to seriously look at and that other leaders can look at as well. That when we don't have that human relation connection that you're talking about, if there's not a trust in others, it's like I totally trust myself. I know I've got the answer. I'm, you know, ego driven about this. And then others, feel like, oh, what are we, lackeys? You know, are we just pawns in your game? I'm exaggerating to a great degree, actually. It's not that mm-hmm. bad. But, uh, you know, I could see where that could happen because someone with a clear vision comes in and uh, doesn't give room for others. Yeah, so insightful. So what would it be a moment that we recognize we're not leaving room for others to share vision? They'll Is tell there- us. <laughs> okay. <laughs> if there's enough psychological safety, right? <laughs> right, right. Yeah. yeah, you're right about that because there does need to be a real sense of trust to be able for everyone to speak their truth and to push back and confront a leader. And if a leader is not getting any pushback about anything, then in a way, what do they need everybody else for? <laughs> yeah. Right. Um, should be getting some pushback does show a sense of trust. Mm, mm, that was so good. Getting pushback shows a sense of trust on your team. I love mm-hmm, that. that That's, yeah, there's some healthy communication, even though as a leader it could be uncomfortable. Yeah. And as a leader, we have responsibility to sit in those uncomfortable moments and put our ego aside and really try to operate from our inner wisdom and inner compassion in those moments, because that's, what's going to create that vision and that passion and that, that innovation and not be like the story you shared before, where the one CEO took over and cut everything. I mean, it it almost sounded like cutting the soul, right? And then people, yeah. And then people, yeah. And that's why people say they're, they're going to a soul crushing job. Or they use language like that because it's really indicative of what's really happening. Yeah. And so on that note. Can I add something else to that? For sure. Because you said, you know, really, I don't remember your exact words, but like you check into your inner knowing, your inner voice. I believe that an organization or project has a soul. And certainly we all have our own soul, our unique expression, our unique purpose, but so does an organization. And some organizations really call people together. There's sort of this attract, strange attractor energy, like you would say in quantum physics. Mm-hmm. And that that is something that we can tap into for guidance as well as our own inner journey. What is the inner soul or the inner journey or the inner purpose of the organization? Imagine it as an energetic entity and call it in or say a prayer to it or ask for guidance. That's, that's one of the things I'm in the process of doing right now is saying not only what is my calling, but what is the greater calling that other people with me are committed to? And then what's my piece of that? Give me guidance. Show me the next steps, at least. We never know the full path, but we always know the next steps if we ask. Mm -hmm. I was just talking to somebody this morning that said something right along those lines that then just that next step kind of shows up that you can step on visually. And Mm -hmm. it was that same, that same visual, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. I like that too, that a company has a soul because it's a collective of people energetically and what kind of energy do you want to collect? And I think that, that by default, people that want to do work for the greater good will be attracted to these types of organizations over maybe the other types. And then I think the system will just by default kind of morph into (laughs) one that operates from a higher consciousness and 
you know, takes human centered workplaces seriously. And there's so much, I mean, just the success of Create Magic at Work, the podcast and everything like that, like so grateful for. So that's in, in the work that you're doing and how many people are, oh my gosh, I, just, I had a, co- um, a colleague the other day say, I had somebody tell me they think they're an edge walker. And I didn't really, really, and they had heard um, the Create Magic at Work podcast and hadn't put it all together. And I, I was like, oh my gosh, like, yeah, it's, for some reason, it's really resonating. So do you feel like it's really resonating right now or at a higher level than before? Oh, clearly, very, very clearly. Yeah. And, you know, there's one way to look at this is what's going on in the world. And there's a chaos and turbulence and unpredictability. The world is in the midst of transformation. It's very uncomfortable. And in order to evolve, those on the fringe of organizations or the edge of systems are the ones that can see the bigger picture and are called to help systems evolve. So they're not in the center. Those in the center want to hold the organization as stable. Those on the margins, the marginalized, the edge walkers, are the ones that are the change agents and can see where, at least that next step that we just talked about, they could see where the organization needs to go or where their work needs to go. So from that perspective, I think that's happening. I also think, in general, humanity is evolving. Evolution is a part of nature. And while we're in the midst of some very difficult and dark times as humanity, these kinds of crises do give us the opportunity to collectively evolve. And for instance, with climate change, we all have to contribute to this, the turnaround of the devastation that's happening with climate change, whether it's something small like turning out the lights or something big like becoming an activist or joining a sustainability organization or whatever it might be. It doesn't matter. We each have to collectively do something. So I think that's another force that's really helping edge walkers to want to find each other and want to support each other and support the changes. And I've been doing this work for 30 years, so I'm hoping <laughs> that some of it has rubbed off somewhere. And as you know, the, the latest work on archetypes of change is really resonating with organizations. And because of all these changes that are happening, and how do we change our mindset about change? And what is the role of spirituality and consciousness in helping us to transform to higher levels for the sake of the greater good? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. What would you say to someone listening that feels like they're an edge walker? This has come up multiple times with different people. Just recently, I interviewed Paul McCarthy. He he started his business called The Fired Leader. He feels he was fired multiple times for actually doing his job. And he calls it disruptive leadership. I've had other people reach out feeling like they're being iced out of their organization. I can't think of a better way to say it. I'm just using my old school terminology, iced out. (laughs) Um, and, or, or quiet firing. That's the lingo on LinkedIn. Is there some form of wisdom or encouragement that you could offer those that feel like they're edge walkers, but feel like they're getting iced out of their organization? (sighs) The first thing I would say is try to stay in and try to make a difference. Mm. The easy way out is to quit and go do your own thing or join a more enlightened organization. But the fact is we need edge walkers in the more soul damaging organization. Otherwise, those organizations are going to die. Uh And so if it's possible, find a way to stay in, find your fellow edge walkers, find ways to support each other, uh, have a spiritual practice, find a spiritual community, whatever you can, unless it's starting to affect your health and well-being. Mm-hmm. And then get out fast. <laughs> you know, mm-hmm. It's like that's when your body starts to tell you this isn't working. You need to pay mm-hmm. attention to that. Um, and then the choice is where do you go next? And so don't repeat the patterns of the past. Really consciously look for an organization that 
is creative, that does have magic, that that allows you to bring your own magic and create your own magic within that organization, or start your own, as some people that we know have done, Mm -hmm. (laughs) and like you, like you, and you know, build your own community and help others that way. Mm -hmm. But so so that's it. The first step is stay if you can and get whatever support you can. And Edgewalkers International, our community is there to help that. That's one. And then two is find out whether or not you can be an entrepreneur and go out and do things on your own because there's so much more freedom, but there's also so much more risk. So it depends on your own family situation and so on. Um, And then if you are going to go into an organization, I actually have a list of what you might call conscious organizations or organizations that support the human spirit in the workplace that um, we can, I can send you the link. I think I've sent you the document in the past. Maybe you just put it on your website so that people can see that as a resource of, you know, here's some organizations that support mindfulness at work or personal development, or there's just various kinds of things that are clues to an organization that's, what I would call an edgewalker organization. They honor the edgewalkers and they honor mm. the spiritual nature of humans. So they exist. Don't give up. Yeah, thank you. We'll put that in the show notes, actually, that link for everyone to have as a resource. Um, oh my gosh. And just referencing that at the end, that's what I was thinking. The other call is for organizations to make room for edgewalkers, make room, have that carved out that that we have this piece if you're looking at all the archetypes of change that you were referencing and and we all we have room for edge walkers here because they're they're a part of of the company yeah one example yeah. going back to that same utility organization that i mentioned that sharon emmons was a part of she's retired now and does mm-hmm. photography to bring her self joy uh, but there was an organ. The human resource department in that organization created a group. I think it was called Cowboys and Rebels. And what they actually did, they didn't know of the word edgewalkers at the time, but they went and they looked for the people who seemed to complain the most about things that were happening, and who were having wild and crazy ideas, who were really kind of edgy in the organization. And instead of marginalizing them, they brought them together. And they develop them as a team with the concept that this is where the greatest ideas and energy could be. And so they help that organization transform from the regulated, bureaucratic, I'm never going to change kind of organization to a deregulated, innovative organization that could could respond to the times. So they actually institutionalized their edgewalkers. I haven't seen anything else like that exactly in in any other organization, but it gives me hope that that could be done. Yeah, that's that's amazing. Yeah, thank you for sharing that. (laughs) But the Cowboys and Rebels, I was asked, I was a guest on a podcast one time, and it was like a quick fire uh, productivity type, you know, podcast guy, a really, really great guy. But he asked me, what my thoughts were on if somebody's not positive, should they be fired? And he named these big name business guys um, like Grant Cardone. And they, if you're not positive, you get fired right away. And I was like, hold on a second. <laughs> this is toxic positivity, right? If people don't have a voice, if it's not ego induced drama, if they're just sharing feedback, you can't shut down everyone's voices because then no one has a voice anymore. And then as a leader, you're surrounded by everyone that's just telling you what you want to hear. And then you collapse. I almost, this is probably not the most, I don't know, politically correct thing to say, but, but I think of like celebrities that surround themselves with people that just tell them what they want to hear And then all of a sudden they go down this journey of plastic surgery and they pretty much lose their face. (laughs) Mm -hmm. And I think of that as like a company analogy, right? If you're not going to allow for people to have a voice and have that feedback, then you might end up without a face down the road. (laughs) Yeah. 
Well, and you know, <laughs> yeah. you're also pointing to where is the authentic self that somebody can be their authentic selves wherever they are and not have to put on a different face in the organization, not put on a mask, but be themselves. And then, the, you know, one of the archetypes of change in the Edgewalker model is the guardians. And the guardians are the ones that look for what's wrong and where things could go mm. wrong, where harm could be created. I would certainly want in any organization, the guardians to have a voice. For instance, preventive maintenance is a function that's a guardian function. They're looking at where could things break down and how do we prevent that from happening beforehand. And so there's there's the human side of that too. You know, where could human breakdown happen? How do we prevent that? Where where are the conflicts that we can get at early in the stage and find out what both people bring to the conversation you know it's basically a form of healing mm, uh -huh. yeah so yeah. I, i'm totally with you that we need to hear all voices if someone's negative all the time and only complains and never brings anything to the conversation i, I think there's an opportunity for development there you know and if if they can't change they would help create the toxic workplace uh -huh. if they can't change so that that might be something where i would say well let's see if we really, if there's some better place this team member would be where they would be happier, either inside the organization or out. Because uh -huh. that complaining and that, that, that kind of negative energy can bring everybody else down. So you want to avoid that too. You know, the Buddhists talk about the middle way. So I think that's what you and I are pointing to is what's the middle way? Uh -huh. Yeah, thank you. So a couple of months ago, I met up with you <laughs> and I, um, before I pull a journal prompt card for everyone, I want to touch on, on one more thing, which is a, a quality of an edge walker. And I was really reaching out to you as a mentor and going through sort of a personal crisis of faith. And you named something while we were um, in session and you said, are you exhausted? <laughs> I'll never forget this. I remember it forever. You said, because everything you're saying to me feels tired. I don't know if these were your exact words, but you said feels tiring. And Edgewalker, an Edgewalker quality is playfulness. Uh. And you really gave me a call to look at things in a, in a more fun and playful way in what I was doing. And I found I was compartmentalizing my work and home. Like, let me finish work so I can go home and play. <laughs> rather than incorpor incorporating some of that playfulness. It, and I know this, right? We just all were, like, I love the other thing you say is we're all on this journey together. And I needed that reminder. And I see it in clients all the time. So how can we recognize when we need more playfulness in our lives? And how can we cultivate that more in work and at home? <laughs> I remember that so well. And I remember your face lighting up when we started to explore ways of having more playfulness in your work. And actually, it, it's what you preach. And it is yeah. how you live. It was just that you're being called to the next level of evolution around that. And we have an instrument, as you know, because you're certified in the Edgewalker profile to use that in your coaching. And the thank you for all the ways that you do that and promote that. And when I look at sort of the overall patterns of how people respond to the five qualities and five skills of an edgewalker, playfulness being one of them, most of the time, playfulness is the lowest. So in a generic way, most of us need more playfulness in our work and in our lives that we're, we're stressed, we are exhausted, we're overwhelmed, and we are not nurturing our souls enough, however that is for each of us. And it's unique for each of us. Although the other pattern that I've seen in people I've coached is the thing that most nurtures people when they're depleted, stressed, overwhelmed, is being in nature. And you can, you know, I say playfulness, but it's really um, a bigger thing than playfulness. It's a spontaneity. It's being alive in the moment. 
and doing what brings you joy. And so playfulness can be a moment of just going out on your back deck and overlooking your yard and watching a bird come by. And it doesn't take a lot of time. Most of us don't have a lot of time. You know, or just if you're visual, you might look up the latest cartoons online or just some little thing that shifts your perspective for a moment. The, from a brain science point of view, playfulness wakens up the whole brain. The right brain, the left brain, the corpus callosum all become integrated. We're smarter when we're playful. So it's actually a good thing for work, but it's usually stepping back from the computer or the Zoom meeting or the document we're working on and going and doing something really different, even if it's only for a minute or two, and then coming back with more of a fresh perspective. Um, but I also think it's very valuable to take longer times of playfulness to readjust our view of the world, not just our view of those particular moments we feel stressed. So I just got back from two weeks of being at a folk festival because playfulness for me is music. That's one of the ways I just have so much joy and creativity and laughter and connection to others. So I spent two weeks at the folk festival in Kerrville, Texas, and it was so renewing and centering, and I feel much more balanced as a result of taking that much time off hardly answering any emails. So you know, I, re I recommend those, like, Two-minute retreats and those two-week retreats, if you can figure out how to make that happen. Thank you. So good. So good. You reminded me of um, Dr. Angelise Arian. Um, she's, she studied the cultures around the world. She said in shamanic societies, if you were down or sort of how I described I was feeling, they, they would ask you, when did you stop singing? When did you stop dancing? When did you stop enjoying storytelling? When did you stop? being able to sit in silence. I'm ad, I'm ad loving it, but it reminds me of all of that. Those are all great, great reminders. Um, Absolutely. And I would turn them around and say, when are you going to start singing? When are you going to start dancing? When's the next time you're going to be silent and so on? Make people it. commit to action. Even if it's yes, only the coach. <laughs> exactly. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Exactly. When are you going to? Yeah. I'm going to start pulling a journal card for everyone. Um, but I was going to say I have a little rescue dog that my boyfriend rescued in the middle of the freeway. And he is like the number one fan of anyone singing, playing the guitar. He just comes and sits around and soaks it in and listens and wags his tail. I've never seen, I've never had a dog that does that before. So you just reminded me of, his name's Lucky. Because, you know, oh, he was sweet. rescued yeah. in the middle. <laughs> so I'm going <laughs> to, yeah. Lucky dog. Our number one fan, and I have the word, I don't have the best singing voice, but he thinks I do. <laughs> All right, I'm going to pull a journal prompt card from my Create Magic at Work journal prompt card deck. We're going to get a message for you and for everyone listening today. Let's see what we get. Oh, wow. <laughs> so we got integrity. Ooh. So okay. interesting. We've never gotten this this year. And we're talking about organizations and all of the other things. So no surprise, this came up. The affirmation for everyone listening is I make sure to carefully plan my work and always deliver what I commit to. So Dr. Judy, if you could just help answer this question, it can maybe bring some wisdom or insight to other people listening. What tasks... Oh, this is so Edgewalker because one of the Edgewalker <laughs> skills is focus, right? Mm -hmm. um, focusing. So this question is, what tasks do you need to complete this week with uninterrupted focus? Wow. The task I need to, to complete this week is a proposal for funding for a project at the Global Consciousness Institute called Mapping the Terrain that is looking at where in the world are different organizations that are focused on global consciousness. And so, and there's my playful little dog. <laughs> yeah, because I was talking about it. He heard me. <laughs> His name is Reiki. And he oh, goes, okay, <laughs> perfect. <laughs> yeah, so, so that's um, what I need to do is, is really figure out what are the goals, who's involved, what's the timeline, what's the budget, because we have a funder interested in it. 
And if I wait too long, the funder may go get interested in something else. So it's time to to get that complete and move it on. Well, one of the skills of an edge walker is focus and focusing. And so I will send you focusing energy to to get that going. And um, yeah, just thank you so much for being a guest on the show. If people want to connect, if people want to learn more about you and your work, where can they find you? The e- My email is judy, J-U-D-I, at edgewalkers.org. And I encourage you to go to the Edgewalker website, which is www.edgewalkers.org. And Thursday, we have an Edgewalker Cafe. Um, Every once a month, we have Edgewalker Cafes, and they're free, and we love to have people join us and be a part of our community. So thank you, Amy, so much for this opportunity to be on your podcast and all the great work you do. And thank you so much for being the beautiful edge walker you are with so much courage and focus and heart and integrity. I'm very grateful you're in my life and my work. Thank you. Thank you so much. And just thank you for your mentorship and for creating edge walkers and for taking the time to share everything with the listeners today. We definitely sent some magic to everyone. Thank you for being on the show. Thank you. My pleasure. Do you have this feeling that you were called to do something very special and important in the world? Do you consciously tune into something higher than yourself for guidance and inspiration? Have you had mystical or spiritual experiences that have provided guidance in your everyday life and work? If you answered yes to those three questions, then you are a fit for a Create Magic at Work coaching program. If you're looking to explore new frontiers in your personal and professional life, I invite you to consider stepping into one of my coaching programs. I specialize in helping people step outside of their comfort zone and embrace the unknown. Whether you're looking to launch a new business venture, navigate a major life transition, or simply push yourself to reach new heights, I can help you achieve your goals. Please schedule a complimentary consultation with me at createmagicatwork.net. Click on work with Amy, and I can't wait to see you. Sending magic to you. I want to thank each and every one of you for coming back every week to listen to a new episode of Create Magic at Work and really helping to support and advocate for healthy leaders, workplaces, and lives for all of us. If you want any information on how to connect with me, click on the link in the show notes. You'll get access to all of the social media links for Create Magic at Work. Stay following along for more amazing episodes where we help you improve productivity and profitability in the workplace and decrease stress. Sending magic to everyone and see you next time.